Uh, we continue uh, our um, discussions today, and the second part, the second session today, uh, has uh, two participants uh, involved um, um, who are present here. Uh, the first one is uh, Denisa Nestakova. Uh, as I should say, um, respecting the Slovak uh, name, uh, who is a PhD candidate in general history at the Faculty of Arts uh, at Comenius, Comenius University in Bratislava. Her research is focused on Arab-Jewish relations during the British mandate, and uh, she's also at the same time completing her uh, second MA uh, in Jewish uh, civilizations. Uh, uh, she has uh, participated in conferences and she's also very involved in the dialogue, uh, interfaith dialogue. And I'm also um, very um, happy to mention that she was an Erasmus student at Krakow University, uh, at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and she reminded me kindly that she was my student. <laughs> So, um, Denisa, the floor is yours. Um, Denisa will be speaking about uh, uh, Gizzi Fleiss, um, uh, Fleichmann, uh, the woman who uh, led Jews in Slovakia during, the, um, during uh, World War II. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was a pleasure and honor to be with you during these three days. I hope I can uh, contribute a little bit. So today, as it was mentioned, I'm going to speak about Gezi Fleischmann, the woman who led Jews in Slovakia during the World War II. Uh, my talk will deal with the Jewish elites gathered in a Slovak version of Judenrat in Slovakia. Uh, and their relationship towards the Jewish community, the Nazis who were in Slovakia, and also to Slovak political elites. Uh, and it will be done by, uh, through the life of Gizzi Fleischmann. So, I hope I can manage this. Okay, so Gizzi Fleischmann, she was born in uh, 1800. Uh, 92 in Austrian Hungary in middle east a uh, middle uh, class Orthodox Jewish family. Her family owned a little um, hotel and a little kosher restaurant. She had two brothers, both of them studied at the university, and they brought home uh, ideas of Zionism. During the uh, uh, introduction of the Czechoslovakia after the uh, World War II, which was built on the ruins of Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, she got married and had two daughters, Judita and Alica. She was married to a um, man called Fleischmann, Josef Fleischmann. Um, however, um, during the uh, establishment of the um, Czechoslovakia, uh, the first autonomic tendencies of Slovak part started to be um, uh, important. However, the, the power of um, autonomic tendencies in Slovakia gathered main, mainly um, in a political party called Slovak People's Party, later Hlinka's Slovak uh, People's Party, were not that important. But the uh, situation in Europe started to change, and with um, when Hitler came to power and the geopolitical situation started to change in Europe, uh, the situation of Czechoslovakia changed, mostly uh, according to the München Agreement. Uh, so, we see here how the um, Slovakia look after their establishment. Uh, the establishment of the um, uh, uh, country was based on a, a situation of chaos, and this was used by the party, which quickly developed uh, uh, authoritarian a totalitarian uh, characteristic, and it immediately subjected the leftish and the Jewish parties uh, to considerable harassment. Slovakia was now one party state. Uh, later on, Hitler invited Tiso to Berlin, urged him to proclaim Slovakia's independence. Therefore, Tiso, as a leader of the Linkas People's Party, um, on March 14, 1939, uh, in Slovak parliament declared independence and Tiso became a uh, president of Slovakia. Remember that President Tiso was a Catholic priest. 
mean, here we have the, um, one of the meeting of Tiso with Hitler. Um, meanwhile, Gizzi became a working woman. She was involved in many, at the time, marginal activities. By mid-1920s, she co-founded in Bratislava a branch of Viso and became its second president. In 1937, she attended 20th Zionist Congress in Switzerland. In 1938, she became the head of the Bratislava hit, uh, branch of HITSEM, the agency that dealt with emigration to countries outside of Palestine. She became a member of the Slovak Central Refugee Committee and the member of the Joint Committee. In late 1939 and 1940, she became involved with illegal immigration transports. Those transports came from, for example, uh, Germany, Austria, and other countries. Uh, there were hundreds of refugees waiting for ships to take them to the Black Sea and then later, uh, further in Bratislava. And the Central Refugee Committee, now under Gizzi Fleischmann, had to take, take care of them. Um, as the situation in Slovakia got worse for its uh, Jewish population, Gizzi had to face several very personal tragedies. She had to send her daughters to Palestine. By 1939, she was alone, uh, so she was uh, facing the loss of her daughter. In one of many, many letters she sent, she wrote also, much as the certainty that the children are in Eretz make me happy, still it is indescribable sad feeling to be alone uh, to be able to see one's children. Um, in, in September 1939, her brother Gustav Fischer was attacked. This attack was most probably done by the German minority uh, living in Slovakia. It was an anti-Semitic attack. Um, unfortunately, uh, he felt in a, such a bad and unfortunate way that, she heard him, uh, that he hurt himself in a way that in two days later after the attack, he died. Uh, consequently, consequently uh, his uh, wife committed suicide. Uh, another thing was connected with the Jewish Codex. It was a set of the anti-Jewish laws uh, introduced on September 9th, 1940. Uh, according to this, uh, her family lost their little business, their little hotel and uh, restaurant. Also, another thing was that in 1942, she became a widow. Her husband, uh, Josef, died, and she also had to take care of her older mother. While Gizzi was having a difficult time, the Slovak government allied itself with Nazi Germany, with actual tool of German influence in Slovakia. Germans' interests in Slovakia were represented by the legation, by a representative of the German national minority, and by special advisors, so-called Berata, who were appointed in every important Slovak governmental office. The most important for our case was Dieter Wesliceni, the advisor on Jewish affairs, nominated in August 1940. In this time, Slovakia was independent state and Jewish councils were uh, established in countries occupied by Nazis. However, in Slovakia, a version of Judenrat, or Jewish center, was established. On September 26, 1940, the government's decree 234 dissolved all Jewish organization in the country and in their stead establish a Jewish center. For all Jewish uh, persons in Slovakia, it was a duty to be a member of it or a part of it. Uh, the elder was um, Heinrich Schwarz, but, uh, uh, but uh, for our case, it's not that important. In the article, I will mention all the elders who were there from 1940 to 1945. Um, however, the Jewish center was very particular from the beginning of its existence. Mainly, it had been introduced in the time when Slovakia was not occupied. There have never been any kind of Jewish police, and it has no legislative power, no courts, nothing similar to them. And it was exactly the German advisor for Jewish affairs in Slovakia, Dieter Wislitzeni, who was engaged in the establishment of the Jewish center due to his competence. 
but the members of the Jewish Center were chosen by the Central Economic Office of Slovak Republic, which also cooperates with Wislitzeni. The, Jew, uh, the German decree that only Jewish males should constitute the forced leadership. As a result, with no, one minor acceptation, Jewish women did not participate in the body of Judenrat, I mean, on a high level. This exception was Gizi Fleischmann, who came to prominence as a head of the Alia or Immigration Department, which was a natural consequence of her prior involvement. The work of Gizi and the Jewish uh, Center included publishing newspaper, taking care of Jewish community, re-education of citizens to craft and agriculture works, on education, cultural and social life, and organizing canteens. But it had been also regarded as a collaborating institution because of several things. It had work on a dislocation of Jews from Bratislava. It, had, it was uh, the initiator of the labor camps and was involved in their building much earlier than it was forced to do so. This initiative was an expression of the belief that the labor camps could be an effective tool to moderate the upcoming deportations. Those camps could mean security for Jews because they would be economically important for the state. Sadly, these camps had been changed into concentration centers from which they organized transports to Poland. In general, Jewish public did not trust the Jewish center in from 1943. In that time, Jews considered the labor camps as a transit station to Auschwitz. The fact that the leaders of the Jewish center tried to convince them to go willingly to camps, they understood as a betrayal and also as a capitulation. In that time, it was publicly more or less known that the concentration camps meant certain deaths. Uh, moreover, some of regulation based on anti-Jewish laws did not need to be followed by the employees of the Jewish center. They did not need to wear a yellow star. They could move freely in public places and cultural institutions because the police hour did not apply to them, which limited the movement of the other Jewish uh, population in Slovakia. They were not excluded from the public life, and they lived in their fla fl flats even after the ordinance of the duty of dislocation of Jews from Bratislava. You can see the family Fischer and Fleischmann sitting in a big villa. They had them till 1944. Gizi Fleischmann is the woman who led Jews in Slovakia during World War II. However, within the Jewish center, no matter what work they did, some of the members established uh, with the beginning of the deportation of Jews, uh, or even early, earlier, a group called Pracovna Skupina, or working group. It can be considered as one of the expression of active resistance ex against the existing situation. There were people from all possible stream of Jewish societies. We have a Orthodox rabbi, a liberal rabbi, an atheist, a reformed Jew, an assimilated lawyer, a secular Zionist, and also the only woman, the Zionist Gizi Fleischmann. She became the main representative of the group. It did not happen via for formal voting, but she got the full support of all members. The group had two goals, to stop deportation and to fight against the Jewish center and those who did work against Jews. Um, the, they apply or they ask to cooperate with men called Karl Hochberg, who was later killed by Jews because of the cooperation and the collaboration with Nazis in Slovakia. 
he went to Vislitseni, who liked him, and Hochba was considered as a protege of Vislitseni. He went there uh, with the, a proposal to halt the deportation. Weissmandl, one of the members of the working group, proposed him to say that there is somebody called Ferdinand Roth, uh, who represent world jewelry. These men never existed, but they wanted to create something bigger. So they created a representative of a world jewelry. And they said that he visited Bratislava to see the possibility of an agreement to save all the Jews of Slovakia. Hochberg came back and said that the price would be $50,000. For that, the uh, expulsion or the deportation would be halted. In theory, the deportation from 1942 till 1944 were halted, but the influence of this is very doubtful. Most probably, the scenario was that the remaining Jews who were not candidates for transportation were converts, people in mixed marriages, holders of the presidential exceptions, there were also a circle protected by the very prominent representative of regime, and some Jews were economically important for the state. In this time, the number of transported Jews were already 55,000. The public opinion of Slovaks started to change. The Catholic and Protestant church had intervened, and there were already news from Poland about camps. The number of Jews who, was not pro who were not protected was smaller because many of them escaped to Hungary. And also the governmental representative of the moderate did not want to accept the suggestion to cancel the exceptions for Jews. However, the Anchorage uh, working group suggested repeating the success regarding other Jewish community. They introduced a plan called Europe, or Europa Plan. This was a large-scale rescue plan to save European Jewry from extermination by paying ransom. Working group started intense contact with the representative of uh, Jewry in Switzerland and in Turkey in order to ask for political and financial assistance. During the negotiation, the Germans agreed to stop deportation of Jews from most of the Europe, and price was two or three million dollars. The representatives in Switzerland, especially Sally Meyer, promised that the uh, GDS would deposit money in the bank in the United States to be taken after war. The US Joint Distribution Committee were extremely reserved. US law forbade negotiation with the enemy and the transfer of dollars to Nazi territory. The member of working group were shocked that the Jews in free world did not comprehend the situation under Nazi occupation. Negotiation lasted uh, till, uh, from 1942 to August 1943. Wislitzeni brought them to the end because the scheduled payment did not arrive. Hochberg was arrested, and the most conversation between working group and Wislitzeni went through Gizi. She and the group believed him till the end. The working group believed that they failed because the Jews of free world would claim the money was not available and could not be transferred. Uh, the main source of the negotiation with Jewish uh, organization and the working groups are letters which had been written by Weissmandl and also and mainly by Fleischmann. One can feel the desperate situation uh, sadness, frustration, sometimes hope and joy, but also the fear and accusation of the orga organization in West. It seemed fairly clear that Schwarz, Schertok, and others who were representing the free jewelry outside of occupied Europe uh, sent some money, not because they believe that such a rescue plan could be practically and could be working, but uh, they didn't want to miss the opportunity to rescue Jews, Jews even if this, the plan was very doubtful. Uh, Weissmantel, after the war, bitterly criticized the Jewish leadership in the West for the unwillingness to support such actions. However, no evidence had been uncovered that link the to, uh, of a bride and a halt of the deportation really existed. 
The truth is that the vice uh, that Vesliceni was a secondary official and could not stop the deportations. The negotiations dragged um, on with Himmler's consent, uh, but it is assumed that the main idea behind the apparent German willingness to discuss the plan lay in Jewish counter-propaganda, because the Europe plan uh, served later as a basis for the negotiation between Eichmann in Budapest, uh, and uh, um, Eichmann and the Jewish community in Budapest. It was quite natural also for Wislitzini to start thinking seriously about the alibi for himself after the war. Gizi is a woman who did not give up. Meanwhile, Wislitzini left Slovakia to help organize deportation for Greece, from Greece but still fed hopes of Slovak Jews. Between 1943 and 1944, the community lived with fear of potential start of other deportations. Those came later in 1944. On August 1920s, 1929, sorry, uh, 1944, the Slovak national uprising burst. After the uprising, German troops immediately entered Slovakia to suppress it. ISIS commander took action against the Jews shortly afterwards. Alois Brunner, on the picture, came to Slovakia. Following the Brunner's, uh, Brunner's arrival, Gizi went to him with a new plan. Firstly, Brunner told them and her that he is willing to consider such a conversation. However, soon 1,800 Jews had been arrested and Gizi had been ordered to liquidate the rest of Jewish center. Gizi was taken to Serek. Uh, there was a before labor camps, this time transit came. There she was inter uh, interrogated by Brunner himself. Then he ordered her to deport her to Auschwitz. The transport sent out from Seret on October 17th. Her name was called from Lauthal uh, in Auschwitz, and she was taken by guards from that moment, and nobody knew what happened to her. Fleischmann had several chances to leave Slovakia and emigrate. She refused and wanted to fight till the end. She witnessed all possible perse per persecution on her own. She had to send her daughters to Palestine to save them, but suffered the distance. Slovak laws caused the erasure of the restaurant and the little hotel of her parents. Her brother was a victim of the anti-Semitic attack and died soon. Afterwards, his die wife committed suicide. In the end, she uh, was killed in a concentration camp. Till the end, she trusted Wislitzeni and later hoped to bribe also Brunner. The exaggerated trust in Wislitzeni should be reviewed with the consideration of the tragic situation in which they were. There is important to realize that they were lacking of the, of, uh, the view and the knowledge we have. No matter how many positive things were in hands of those who represent Slovak Jewish Center, it is sadly famous for implementing the orders of the Nazi policy, policy or the policy of local government. As has already Hannah Arendt said, quote, to a Jew, this role of the Jewish leadership in the construction of their own people is undoubtedly the darkest chapter of the whole dark story, end of the chapter. But the most important feature of Gizi Fleischmann and her working group was the fact that they tried to save the whole European Jewry in the situation when they themselves were on the edge of the destructive pit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I uh, will um, not uh, have today uh, the second speaker mentioned uh, in the program, Neboisa Ozimic, uh, who couldn't come for the conference for um, uh, some personal and health reasons. Um, the, well, the second person who will be speaking today within this session is Verena Buse, uh, who is uh, um, who um, received uh, her PhD from the Center for Research on Antisemitism at uh, the Technical University in Berlin, where she has worked for more than 10 years uh, now on uh, the history of concentration camps. Uh, at the moment, she's also working on her 
habilitation proposal um, uh, devoted to the history of ITS, International Tracing Service, uh, and uh, its archives, and also the repatriation of uh, Germanized children from uh, Wartagau and uh, general government. Um, she is also a uh, lecturer at uh, Salomon University in Berlin. Uh, the topic of the presentation, the topic of uh, her pa pa paper is um, uh, Karl Demmerer, a leader of the camp elite in Blechhammer. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much to Marta and the IPN for the possibility to be here and present my research. And thank you to the audience that you are still here because it's the last lecture for today. <laughs> now I start with some more or less theoretical considerations. The term Jewish elites refers to Jewish men and women occupied, who occupied an exposed or privileged position during the National Socialist dictatorship. <clears throat> An assumed privileged position was most often, if we look at many scholarly works, related to two seemingly mutually exclusive patterns of behavior of the position holder, which can be defined as collaboration or resistance. But were, and this is my opinion, mutually exclusive patterns of behavior really the case during the Holocaust? Isn't individual behavior in complex social environments uh, or extreme situations rather ambivalent, conflicting, or paradoxical. In other words, one single, per one single person's behavioral patterns can combine both collaboration and resistance. This is what I wish to illustrate in some minutes with the following case, that of Karl Demerer. The topic of Jewish collaboration was and remains a highly complex field of Holocaust research. As we learned from the Kapo trials in Israel and from various researchers, it was a huge challenge to judge crimes com committed by persecutors who were defined as collaborators. The same difficulties emerged in the Jewish honor courts after the war's end. Saul Friedländer, for one, did not even mention the gray zone of Jewish collaboration in his works. This is a pity, as a look, for example, at the concentration camps, reveals that compared to the number of functionaries overall, Jewish prisoner functionaries, both men and women, were a minority, but among the survivors, there were quite a few. Additionally, we should keep in mind that we, we speak today of Jews as an entity, but might forget sometimes that it were the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 that defined who was a Jew. And many people of Jewish descent who were not Jewish themselves were persecuted regardless. To come full circle, if we talk about Jewish elites, leaders or Jews in assumingly privileged position positions as, for example, in the camps, we should be careful. Think of a non-Jew who was persecuted, of a non-Jewish Jew who was persecuted as a Jew and imprisoned in ghettos or camps, and who became a capo. Is he or she a collaborator? I'm deeply convinced that the subliminally assumed solidarity of the victims or of the persecuted in many scholarly words, works was the exception, not the rule. Primo Levi and other non-prominent um, uh, survivors describe that fact in their accounts, while Holocaust research focused on the positive aspects. And this is not wrong, but sometimes I ask myself if the historical weighting is balanced. Now I come to Demara. Blechhammer was a camp of the organization Schmelt, which established a camp system in East Upper Schlesia separate from the concentra concentration camp system. The Schmelt camps are prominent as it was there, apart from the Aktion 14F13, that the first systematic selection of Jews was carried out. Trains to Auschwitz were stopped at Kose, 
and inmates were selected for forced labor. Blechhammer was a large complex that consisted of several camp units, for example, a forced labor camp, prisoners of war camp, a work camp, a re-education camp, and the so-called Judenlager, the Jewish camp. And this is the uh, camp where this uh, specific uh, person was interned. The Jewish camp in Blechhammer was at least until spring 1944, when it was incorporated into Auschwitz III, a camp where less intolerable living conditions can be identified. At the point of its liquidation in January 45, there were about 3,000 men and 200 women living there, most of them Polish Jews, but also some from the Netherlands, France, or uh, Germany. In January 45, the last prisoners were forced to leave Blechhammer and were sent on death marches, of which the last ended up in Bavaria. Although the uh, Schmelt camps comprised a separate KISS system, they bore many similarities to the concentration camp system. At the top of the camp's interior hierarchy were the camp elders, functioning as liaisons between the SS and prisoners. They were directly subordinate to the SS. A look at men's concentration camps illustrates the daily task of the camp elders and their areas of competence. They were responsible for the whole administration, the deputy administrated the labor division, and had to carry out the camp rules and penalties. In the Schmelt camps, it was different. The so-called Lagerälteste or Judenälteste took most often responsibility for all those mentioned daily tasks. And it was also characteristic for the Schmelt camps and later on also in Baltic concentration camps like Weivare in Estonia, with a population of only Jewish men and women, Jews were able to enter privileged positions, even as Lagerälteste. They were called, called here Judenälteste. And I showed you the letter. Here you see the stamp of the Judenälteste Demra. Karl Demra was born in June 91 in Vienna and reported in an oral history interview conducted in Yad Vashem in 1933 that he was born into a non-religious family. As his father died when he was six months old, his mother went to Biawa near Bielitz, which is Bielsko Biawa today, in Upper Schlesia. He attended a Polish school, although his mother tongue was German. At the age of 15 or 16, he returned with his family to Vienna. Deprivation and starvation were part of the everyday life of the family. During a holiday, some years later in uh, Katowice, Katowice then, uh, he met his future wife, Henia from the Snowviets. There he is, this is Kaldema. He met his future wife, Demi, uh, Henia, and they had two children, um, Halina born in 1933 and Heinrich born in 1931. Sosnowiec was invaded by German troops, troops two weeks after the assault on Poland in 1939. In 1940, he, had to forced, he was forced to leave his family to perform forced labor at various work camps for Jews in Upper Schlesia. From 1942 onwards, Karl Demra was in Blechhammer. There he be became the highest ranked prisoner of influence in the camp's social stratification promoted because, as he said, spoke a real good German. He served as the Judenälteste of the Judenlager for the whole time of the camp's existence. Due to his connections to Alfred Ludwig, employee of the organization Schmelt, whose headquarters was in the Sovjets, his family was transferred to Blechhammer before the final liquidation of the ghetto in Schrodula. This reunification was a survival strategy of imprisoned Jewish forced laborers in the Schmelt camps and was a life-saving measure during this time and in this region. While working on this lecture, I analyzed all interviews in the archive of the Shoah Foundation and other archives. 
when I was seeking interview partners who testified about the Blechhammer camp and its Juden eldest Demera, I found the following index terms to describe his function. Jewish camp police, SS, SD personnel, and Jewish survivor. In my eyes, this shows how survivors' views of this man depended on whether they were part of his designated group or not. As Demara was not able or not willing to protect his fellow prisoners, all of his fellow prisoners, some of them regarded them as, as their protector, others reported negative experiences. But it is striking that he was remembered more for, what he, for whom he saved than for whom he mistreated. Now, can we identify specific strategies of Demara used to increase the chances of survival for at least some fellow prisoners? I wish to come back to my considerations from the beginning of this talk, mutually exclusive patterns of behavior, and would say that Demara unconsciously or not applied a methodology that I would define as functional cooperation. Mm -hmm. In addition to crucial outside factors, and I will not mention them here, it's too long, Demar's strategies were his connections. He reported that he developed a close contact and a good relationship with the Sturmbahnführer Alfred Ludwig, who worked for the organization Schmelt. As I know from the court files of the Central Agency, Agency for the Investigation of National Socialist Crimes in Ludwigsburg, Ludwig and Demra shared some parallels in their biographies. Ludwig was around the same age as Demra in his early 40s, came from Vienna too. The second point is that connections were only possible as Demra self-consciously took advantage of the corruptibility of the camp commander and bribed him, for example, in a situation which decided over life and death of female prisoners who were tattooed with wrong Auschwitz numbers and should be transferred to Birkenau. In another situation, he adopted some kind of chutzpe or strategy that might be defined as embrace your enemies. Asked by the Lagerführer, tell me Demera, and I quote here, tell me Demera, I am not the camp leader and you are not the camp elder. Tell me, what do you believe who will win the war? Quote, End quote. Demera, who later described himself as German Jew, who had become an Israeli, ans answered, quote, we will, of course, end quote. The camp leader looked at him, asking what he meant, and Demera replied, and I quote again, we Germans, Herr Lagerführer, end quote. They both, they both smoked cigarettes, and then Demera told him about diamonds that he that he said he had found by chance. With that, he saved 40 children from their transfer to Birkenau. By the way, I was not able until today to prove that story. But as a result, protection of others, of these, uh, because of these um, strategies, protection of others became possible. In the end, in the camp, the rules were often interpreted arbitrarily. Demera had a large say in building up a cohort of functionaries when camp positions had to be filled. He testified, and I'll quote again, there was no whip used to bring order, not one carp who carried a whip. No one was beaten. You only did it here and there, if you had to, in front of the SS, to show, that them, to show them that you are tough, end quote. Checking interpretation of camp life in Blechhammer I read survivor testimonies. They back up Demara's version most often. For example, one survivor um, remembers that, I quote again, he saved many lies, he would lie and cheat. He punished carpus who beat up prisoners. He really ran that thing and kept the camp in order. The Germans appreciated this, end quote. Emanuel Weinblum, another survivor, describes him with the following words. And I quote again, he was acting as being cruel in the camps, appeasing in the camp, inter intervened in the camp that the Nazis did not touch the prisoners directly. He was an excellent actor, end quote. But in the end, in, I shorten it a little, in the end, in my opinion, and as far as I read the 
the, the documents and the testimonies, his de decisions were, in contrast to the position of the Judenrat in the respective ghetto, lonely ones. He was, not he was not only responsible for the whole administration, but also administrated the labor division and finally had to carry out the camp rules and penalties, which meant um, executions by hanging. A look at his testimony reveals that most of his crucial decisions he took on his own risk and not within a cohort of fellow prisoners, where it was possible to discuss advantages and disadvantages of, of a decision. For example, when he had to send away women's prisoners to another camp, not one single woman wanted to leave voluntarily, as the destination of this specific transport was uncertain. He decided to add the names of his wife, Henia, and daughter, Halina, on the transportation list, as this step gave security to other women in Blechhammer, most of the prisoners wanted to join Henia and Halina Demra. Maybe his position and the unimaginable responsibility had an impact on his everyday behavior and led to the fact that once he beat up his son, who was for the whole time with him, seriously. We know from this event because of the memories of his son. The reason was that the boy played with the rule of Jan and there was an inspection in the camp by a, a high-ranking SS officer who um, visited the camp. And then they, they discovered that, the boy, that there was this yarn, and they said, we have to punish the person who did that, who is the evildoer. And then, um, as the Juden eldest or camp elder uh, um, uh, was confronted, confronted with the fact that his son was the so-called evildoer, he said he would punish the son himself. But what followed were two slaps, but being alone with his son later, something happened that remained in the memory of the son for the rest of his life. His father beat him with a belt, and in his testimony he stated, he then beat me so hard that I won't forget it for my entire life. At the evening in the barrack, the cook explained it to me. For the Germans, everything could be sabotage, and for sabotage there was only one punishment, death." End quote. As I mentioned before, most of the survivors whose testimonies I've read or watched benefited from an improvement of living conditions. They explained that they owned their lives due to his actions or were part of his subgroup. While most of the eyewitnesses saw him as a rescuer, a real man, one person reported the following. I quote, I lost my parents to the policies of Jews in the camps. My brother-in-law had his wife there. The girlfriends were jealous of my sister. I had a very good-looking sister. The Juden eldest said something, and they took away my father, my mother, my sister, my brother-in-law, and another doctor, and they went." End quote. Thus, there are doubts as to whether he was really such a positive figure, and the question arises at the revelation that Demara sent away unwanted fellow prisoners who, they, who today cannot testify. We will never know if his behavior can be explained by an assumed Jew Jewish solidarity or the wish not to be a victim of the SS policy, a megalomanic, maniac personality, or, a sim or simple responsibility, or all the above. I would say that he used cooperative methodologies to resist the conditions in which the life of a Jew was worth worthless. And uh, in 1963, the German government um, conducted um, uh, investigated against Demara and the Israelis too because of accessory to murder. But um, in the end, we will never know if he was a rescuer or a egoist with the ability to manipulate manipulate others, but ultimately, I have wondered, is that important? If we know that the rescuer can also ha can have his dark side, we gain a greater understanding of human behavior during the Holocaust, at least in my eyes. I wish to conclude with some short considerations again. Most often scholars conclude that Jewish elites or Jewish leaders were either collaborators or rescuers. But I find this conceptualization a little bit dis difficult, as the term collaboration, first used in 1940 after a meeting between Hitler and Marshal Philippe Pétain, 
head of the Vichy regime cannot be transferred without problems from the political context of Western Europe, the state collaboration, onto the collaboration in Poland or Eastern Europe, and ought not be used to describe the behavior or agency of individuals during the Holocaust, as I hope to demonstrate with the example of Demra. I would use the term functional cooperation instead. It comprises multi-layered forms of cooperation, for example, on the private level, on an institutional level, or cooperation as a strategy of survival. The most, or one important, or most, the most important feature of functional cooperation, cooperation is that it is in contrast to collaboration, not synonymous with the acceptance of the ideology or the ideological program of the oppressor. And now I come to the end with a quote from Hermann Josef, who was the um, camp elder in the first Grube satellite camp. He wrote to a former fellow prisoner on, in 1968, I quote, I once told a judge that when I was in Auschwitz, I became accustomed, accustomed to wandering about each person I encountered, what he had done in the camp, whether in Fürstengrube or in Natzweiler. And then I would rank him based on my experiences with people in this utterly incomprehensible situation. Then the judge asked me what I thought he would have been doing he had been in a concentration camp. I told him, you might have become a block Elchester, obsessed with absolute cleanliness. He seemed to be satisfied with that until I asked, do you know how you would have achieved the highest degree of cleanliness, end quote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we've had uh, two very interesting presentations and now we have a few minutes uh, for questions and uh, discussion. Questions and comments. Very short one. Uh, I really like Verena's approach, uh, non-judgmental approach to this. Uh, non you're not judging, and, and using Primo Levi gray zone, I think, is another kind of way of uh, evaluating. At the end, what really matters how many people survived in Blackhammer versus I don't know any other camp. So, and I would be very cautious with quoting Hannah Arendt. Uh, she should be the last person to judge people uh, sitting in New York and then coming to Jerusalem. So it's a little bit outdated. Be careful with this. There was a whole discussion, as you know, about her approach versus uh, general approach, which we have now. So, but in uh, question for Denisa, the correlation between national uprising and deportation in your opinion, if national uprising Slovak would not take place, the community would stay in Slovakia due to bribes and uh, activities of working group, or it would happen anyway? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Comments? Okay, so let's uh, let's start with uh, um, the answers. I guess this was not a uh, question of you. I think more or less a statement. Yes, thank you. And I don't like Hannah Arendt, so it's it does not describe the human side. Yes, and that's thank you. I quoted Hannah Arendt just because of this, because she she is the one who kind of. Uh, wake up the audience, and I knew that it's the third date, so I was expecting something, so thank you. And uh, the connection between uprising and deportation. Um, I think it wouldn't, if there would be no uprising, the deportation perhaps wouldn't start it. But maybe not because the bribery or anything else, just because the situation would be different. Because of the uprising, the German occupied Slovakia at that time, and then the, the deportation was done by Germans. Before the 42 was done by Slovak government. That's the reason. But I wouldn't say that the, that the bribery was the, the thing. Uh, I wonder if we have any other questions from the audience. Um, 
There were several issues uh, raised by the participants about the strategies of survivals, and also I think uh, the gender is issue uh, was also uh, quite present. Uh, so um, I, um, I have a question just to sum up the two presentations for, for the both participants. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, was the most strategic part of uh, their survival methods, the idea of what would be the best, how to uh, behave to survive in both cases. It's not that difficult to answer in this individual case because it started already in 1940 and I know that maybe so it was not the question of survival or not and it developed, yes? And he stayed until 1944 and um, you know, this is the case uh, while presenting an individual example. You have so much ambivalent testimonies and you have this person and his individual behavior I would, if I would answer in his words, he was a um, hero, he was the king of the camp, and so on. But in the end, um, it's not that easy to answer, sorry for that, but because I think he, he was a very, very... Um, what is that? Yeah, the person is megalomanic, yes? Mm -hmm. Maniac, yes. I'm, sh I'm not sure, but this is what I read when I talk to his family and so on and so on. And so I think he did not have the method, but for him it was sure that he wa wanted not to be a victim, but he wants wanted to say the person who has the say in the camp. And I'm not sure if there was something like Jewish solidarity. As I said, he was not that religious or in a cultural way associated to, to Jewish religion. Um, the gender issue. Um, Gizzi Fleischmann wouldn't be under such a position without the establishment of the Jew Jewish center. She had the position of elite, but in a very marginal way. The um, um, migration, the immigration from Slovakia wasn't that important in, before war started, before the, the all anti-Jewish uh, laws started to apply. Um, she, in a way, according to the letters and testimonies, enjoyed her position, but there are many testimonies claiming that she was really like a sane person, she was very nice, she was taking care of refugees, she was bringing fresh milk, um, she was trying to keep the, the um, uh, contact between the, those people who were transported. Um, they were sending a little packages with food, with the clothes, and etc., etc. But uh, on the other hand, there are testimonies of others who would um, blame uh, Jewish center in Slovakia, and they would blame them because they had the position um, of, um, let's say, power, or they didn't need to, um, that the uh, anti-Jewish law didn't apply to them. But what would be my opinion on how to survive in her case? She had so many possibilities to emigrate, so many possibilities. From 38 to 44, she didn't and she wanted to stay, she wanted to fight, which is nice and it's heroic in a way. On the other hand, she had no power in 44 to do a thing, but she felt that she must stay with her community, so... So I guess we can uh, leave all the other questions for the panel discussion and uh, the discussion afterwards. And now we can continue the discussions uh, during the coffee break. Thank you, the panelists, for uh, these wonderful presentations.